So it is our pleasure today to welcome Navin Raman Kudi, um, and his title is extremely long and I'm going to do it because before I just say he works at UBC, but now we have to give the full scope for you to understand how wonderful it is that we have him here with us today. So he is a professor and the Canada Research Chair in Global Environmental Change and Food Security at the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs and the Institute for Resources, Environment, and Sustainability uh, at UBC. And uh, he has contributed to the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report and to the fourth assessment report of Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change. So very appropriate for him to be here with us today on the topic of climate change and organic. Um, he also is the editor of Journal, the Journal of Global Food Security and Global Ecology. And Bio, bio, bio geography. He's also the associate editor of environmental research letters. So it is our pleasure to have you speak today on a fantastic piece of research, which um, I've referenced many, many pieces uh, over time, uh, comparing the performance of organic systems to conventional. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. It's really a pleasure to join you to talk about our work. Um, also because of COVID, I always say it's also kind of an opportunity to invite you all a little bit into my home uh, right behind me, which I never get an opportunity to. Um, so today I'm going to talk about, uh, when I say my work, it's actually the work of my uh, former PhD student, uh, Verena Seifert. Um, she's the one who sort of designed this research and kind of took me along with it. A lot of the research that we do as faculty members are often driven by students. So I want to acknowledge her work um, she's currently in Amsterdam um, uh, as a, a new assistant professor, and uh, while continuing to do this work, she's now a mom, and uh, with the time zone, she's, she was not able to present, so I, I offered to, to do it instead. Um, so the work that we did, or Verena did uh, over the course of her PhD, was to look at the performance of organic agriculture uh, relative to conventional across a suite of different dimensions. Uh, we looked at productivity, uh, in particular, just looking at yields, um, but also looking at environmental dimensions and also benefits for producers and consumers. So this is sort of a broad framework within which we designed our research. To start with looking at organic yields relative to conventional, um, prior to um, some more recent work in the last decade, the estimates for how organic yields compared to conventional varied um, widely from minus 50% um, by some estimates to plus 32% um, uh, in a more recent study. So we, when these studies came out at some point, Verena proposed uh, you know, doing a more kind of systematic analysis of these studies. And that's where our studies uh, started. And subsequent to the, our work, and in parallel with our work, a couple of other studies have also come out and I'll be referring to them later. Um, but the, the, the work that we did uh, was published in this paper, uh, in this paper, looking at the yields of organic and conventional agriculture. And what we did was uh, what's known as a meta-analysis, uh, which is an analysis of analysis of 66 different comparative studies. We had a total of 300 observations comparing organic yields and conventional yields. So these are experiments like the Rodale experiment that you almost everyone knows about. But there are lots of other experiments, comparative experiments around the world. And we wanted to say across these different studies, what do we know about how organic yields compared to conventional? And this is what we found um, that um, in this graph shows organic to conventional yield ratios on the x axis. And you can see the vertical line that's number, that's one. Anything to the left uh, means that organic is lower than conventional yields. And if it's to the right, it means organic is a lot uh, greater. We found that across all crops, that is the 300, 316 observations we had, that organic yields were about 25% lower than conventional yields. But that was not the only story. What was more interesting in our work is that when we looked at different kinds of crop types, we found that organic yields were sometimes closer and sometimes further away from conventional yields. So for fruits and oil seed crops, we found that the difference between organic and conventional yields uh, were indistinguishable while for cereals and vegetables, it was much higher. When, and we hypothesized that this was because of the crop types. Uh, we found that legumes and perennials had um, indistinguishable yield gaps compared to conventional, while non-legumes and perennials had higher yield gaps. 
So we essentially argued that you know the yields, the average yields are not really important. We also need to look at the different contexts, um, the performance of organic versus conventional under different contexts. Um, so the overall yields, as I said, was 25% lower, but we found that looking at different systems, um, if you look at two systems that are exactly comparable in terms of organic versus conventional, the yield gaps could be as high as 34%. But when organic agriculture was using best management practices, or if you look at the very best organic practice, the yield gaps could be as low as 5%. So in our work, I don't have time today to go through all the details, it's in our paper, we found that the best organic performance, which means organic uh, yields are closest to conventional yields for legumes and perennials in rain-fed conditions, in soils that are neither too acidic or alkaline, in longer established sites, which means that it takes time for organic yields to catch up to conventional following transition, and when using best management practices. I must say that after our paper was published, another study came out um, that uh, refuted some of our work. Um, and I think I should speak to that today. Uh, the title of that paper was that Diversific diversification practices reduce organic to conventional yield gaps. And what they did was, they also did a meta-analysis, uh, but by, by the time this paper came out, they were able to collect a lot more studies. So they did a study of 115 comparative studies with. Uh, over 1,000 observations, so three times as many observations of organic and conventional yields. The other thing they did is um, I, they did do some uh, better statistical analysis. So in our studies, we had some kind of research design issues that uh, they improved upon. And this is the overall result of their study. Instead of a 25% lower yield, they found that yields were about 19% lower. That's the top plot. But additionally, they found that some of the differences that we had found between annuals and perennials, um, they didn't find those differences. So you can see here that the error bars in these two, um, two different estimates overlap, which means they found that annuals and perennials don't differ in terms of yields uh, compared to conventional. But both of them are lower. The yield gaps, are, they still have yield gaps relative to conventional yields. The same thing they found that legumes, and there's no difference between legumes and non-legumes they did seem to find that fruits and nuts and oilseed crops had closer, uh, their yield gaps were lower uh, compared to other crop types. But again, across all of these studies, um, all of these different conditions, they found that organic yields were lower than conventional yields. The title of their paper, the, their you know, key result was that multi-cropping and crop rotations substantially reduce the yield gap. This is taken from their paper to about 9% and 8% 8 respectively. So those are the two points that I've highlighted there. But this was a key thing from their paper. Um, they go on to say when the methods were applied in only organic systems. Um, so essentially they were comparing organic systems that applied rotations and multi-cropping to conventional systems that did not. But when they compared systems that were comparable, the yield gaps became higher. Um, so my conclusion from looking at these studies is that there are lots of uh, quantitative differences between the studies, but no substantive difference between the two studies. We found 25% lower yields. They found 19% lower yields. We found um, no. Uh, we found yield gaps for um, no organic yield gaps for legumes and perennials. They found that the yield gaps persist. We found that yield gaps are smaller in certain soils or management practices. They did not. We found that for comparable systems, yield gaps, yield gaps are lower by 34%. They found it's lower by 16 to 21%. While they found that organic yields under best practices are eight to 9% lower, we actually found it was even lower, 5% lower. So in a sense, you know, my conclusion is that there are two different studies that uh, have looked at the same thing using different data sets and the substantial, substantive conclusions are actually the same. And Verena has since, um, done an intercomparison paper where she compared not only the two, two studies that I just talked about that are at the, very, at the bottom, but three other studies that have since come out. The top two are just focused in the United States and in Europe. And across all of these studies, organic to conventional yield gaps um, are lower and ranging from you know, something like 20% to 35%, or sorry, 25%. But here's the interesting thing. This is the 
frequency distribution of all the yield gaps across all of these four studies for which we had data. So this now plots all of the individual studies of, of organic to conventional yields. And you can see that there's a frequency distribution that's slightly shifted below zero. So you can see that the average organic to conventional yield gaps are lower than zero, but there's a distribution that for certain conditions, the yield gaps are much, much lower, but there are lots of conditions where organic yields were actually higher than conventional yields. So this is a context dependency that, that I think we need to focus on, on not just the averages. You may be asking now, you know, why do we care about yields? So what? Um, I don't go to a grocery store and buy organic produce because I'm thinking about yields. I'm thinking about a whole bunch of other things like pesticides and environmental outcomes. Um, so in a review paper, and this was a systematic review study, we, um, the title was Many Shades of Gray, the Context Dependent Performance of Organic Agriculture. I'll show you why Many Shades of Gray soon. Um, so we wanted to ask how organic agriculture compares to conventional agriculture. And in this case, we look, looked at it um, across 11 different dimensions that we, we think we should care about in terms of agriculture and 26 different criteria. We looked at these um, uh, four things. We looked at yields, environment, producer, and consumer benefits. And I'm just gonna focus on the environment first. Um, we found comparing organic agriculture to conventional agriculture that organic has many, many benefits. Um, in this flower diagram, what we are showing you here, um, the circle represents a, a condition where organic and conventional performance is the same. If the petals of this flower diagram are outside of the circle, organic is superior. So we found, for example, that organic has superior um, biodiversity outcomes, 10% species richness, plus 48% abundance, greater soil organic matter, um, less nitrogen loss, nearly equal phosphorus loss, um, less nitrous oxide emissions. The only place where it did not do so well was in methane emissions with greater methane emissions, also 40% less energy use. So this is good news. I also wanna say we, didn't, we couldn't find studies on water use at all, which is kind of a puzzle. In any case, um, we found that organic uh, does have a lot of environmental benefits. Uh, but the, one of the uh, sad things is that this was comparing two farms that are about this of the same area. Um, but we also know that organic has lower yields. And so to do a fair comparison, we should be comparing it per unit product. So to produce the same amount of food, how does organic agriculture compare to conventional? So you need to be looking on the one hand at the environmental outcomes, on the other hand at the production as well. But there were far fewer studies um, that looked at both the production outcomes um, as well as the environmental outcomes. And that's why the many shades of gray that when we started looking at comparisons per unit output, uh, we found very little information across many of these dimensions. Also, we found that some of the benefits that we found um, in the per unit, per unit area analysis diminished when we went to per unit output analysis. Um, this essentially says that there's a trade-off in organic agriculture between yields and environmental outcomes, and that's a trade-off we need to deal with. Uh, that's what I said. But essentially the conclusion should be that we actually need a lot more studies. In our analysis, we found that lot, there were lots of shades of gray, lots of uh, dimensions and criteria for which we didn't really have enough evidence. Uh, this is the kind of uh, summary slide from that, um, from that paper. Um, these are per unit output comparisons. Um, in addition to all the environmental um, outcomes, which are in green here, we looked at a whole bunch of socioeconomic outcomes and we did find that organic agriculture does have higher profit, prof, profitability for farmers uh, because of the premium price. We did think that evidence suggests that organic does provide more rural employment because our organic is more labor intensive. And we found that organic agriculture does seem to have a lot of nutritional benefits. Um, and there's a lot of controversy about this, uh, but the, the one clear uh, benefit was lower pesticide residues on in organic farming. Uh, but one, Another big drawback in addition to yields was that organic has uh, lower consumer price. Although this is uh, in gray because we couldn't quantify it, um, all the data that we looked at does show that organic is more um, uh, expensive, more unaffordable to people. So why is organic's environmental performance lower than we might expect? I mean, a lot of people and myself and Verena believe that organic agriculture's environmental performance will be really strong. That's why you know, I don't go to the grocery store because I worry about yields, I worry about uh, its environmental performance, but clearly there are trade-offs with yields. 
Um, to look into this, I just briefly talk about another study where we, we analyzed eight different organic regulations around the world, um, the US, EU, Australia, Mexico, India, and Uganda, but and also two international standards. Um, we read these regulations and we um, asked in these regulations, what are they actually regulating for? Uh, what principles, what management practices are being regulated and how strongly? And this is what we found. Um, across these eight different studies, we found that the, the this is uh, coded across principles and if it's a one or a two, it means it's the most important principle being regulated in, in the, being uh, articulated in those regulations. We found that the idea of natural is the most important principle being regulated. Uh, while things like biodiversity or water uh, come at the end of these regulations. In other words, um, organic agriculture regulations are strongly focused on being a chemical-free um, agriculture. On the other hand, we asked a flip side question, which is, uh, you know, how do organic agriculture um, regulate environmental best practices? So this is a list of uh, environmental best practices taken from a paper on agroecology by Altieri and another colleague. Um, and then we asked, you know, what do these regulations say about these environmental best practices? And again, the green colors here say that they are well regulated and the reddish and orangish colors say they are not. And we found that only for crop rotations um, are organic regulations, or that's the only environmental best practice that organic regulations seem to emphasize. And also interestingly, we found that Mexico seems to be the one that seems to uh, regulate a lot of these environmental best practices as well. So our, our kind of uh, conclusion on why this is happening, why our regulations not focus so much on, organ on uh, environmental best practices um, is summarized in this figure. We think that our, the organic se sector is strongly consumer driven and consumer surveys show that uh, consumers are strongly um, buying organic because of their health reasons. Uh, they're concerned about pesticide residues. It's the single most important reason uh, people say. And so we think that even though producers um, who are driven by original organic theoreticians who argue about environmental benefits, um, human health benefits, and animal health benefits of organic. Uh, producer, producers might uh, you know, want to do better environmental practices on the farm. The regulations don't um, actually um, uh, regulate or enforce that. Um, and in for, so while there may be many organic producers who are managing their land very well, not everyone needs to do that because of uh, the, the way regulations are structured. And we think that it's because it's mostly consumer driven. So the recommendations from this study uh, would be first is to just say that it's more of a caveat than a recommendation. I recognize that this in intercomparison, uh, intercomparison is not entirely fair to organics. Um, um, conventional agriculture has had investments for you know, 40, 50 years um, in a way that organic has not. So we can't uh, compare organic that hasn't had so much investment to, to a type of agriculture that had investments for 40 or 50 years. Another analogy I often use is to think about uh, uh, when the first hybrid cars came out, um, the, um, one, of, one NGO did a intercomparison of hybrid cars to conventional cars. They did a life cycle, and ask, uh, uh, life cycle assessment and found that hybrid cars were worse than um, conventional cars. And there was a huge outbreak saying that you can't compare those things. You, hybrid car is a new technology. You can't compare it to a conventional car, an internal combustion engine that's had hundreds of years of uh, investment. So it's, we can make a similar argument here um, that organics should not be compared to conventional, that, that the comparison is unfair. But just like knowing the weakness of hybrid cars compared to conventional was useful in improving it, I think it's also useful to know where today organic does not perform very well. So I think. You know, our, an, our analysis shows that the two important weaknesses of organic is uh, its productivity and its affordability. We need to improve that. We also need to better identify contexts in which organic performs well, um, and at the same time, close the performance gaps in other contexts. Also think that organic regulations should strengthen environmental best practices. I know that this is quite challenging because organic regulations want to capture as many people as, uh, uh, as possible, and the more they strengthen regulations, the fewer farmers might buy in. Um, but we do need to focus on environmental best practices somehow. And then I also think that we need to, you know, more you know, from a bigger picture, I didn't really talk about this, that we need to think beyond food supply. Uh, we often think about, when we think about our food system challenges, we focus so much on the supply side, we don't think so much on the, on the demand side. 
So there are lots of uh, you know benefits to be had in reducing food waste, shifting to more plant-based diets, that, and I think organic alone is not enough, but it needs to be part of a, a package of solutions. Thank you very much.